If you enjoy this video, please consider giving a thumbs up. It really helps the channel. And if you have any ideas for future videos, share them in the comments section below. So as you listen to me, you can allow yourself to close your eyes, make sure you're comfortable, and you can begin to drift off asleep. And as you drift asleep comfortably, so you can have my voice going on in the background. And while my voice talks in the background, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep comfortably with the sound of my voice in the background, or whether it'll be with the words that I use, or perhaps you'll drift asleep faster and more comfortably with the spaces between my words. And so as you drift comfortably asleep, I'm just going to tell you a story. A story about a young lad who one day went to the library. And he had never really been in libraries. He'd never really been interested in going into libraries. He liked sitting at home playing computer games. He'd never really thought about reading books. But as he was out walking one day, thinking about the games he wanted to be playing, looking forward to getting home, he decided to take a slightly different route. And so as he walked this different route, he was curious about the different sights, the different sounds. He was walking past different houses, past open green areas with trees, different parks. He walked past a park with black iron railing fence, ran his fingers along the fence, bouncing his fingers from rail to rail. He noticed that on the ground in the park and along the edge of the fence were leaves that had fallen from the trees. He could notice the rustling of the leaves as the wind blew a breeze. And while he was walking along, he saw what looked like an interesting old building. And he was curious about this interesting old building. He'd never been this way before, and so he'd never been near or in this building. So he looked at the building. And he noticed there was a sign saying it was the library. and that it was free to come into the building. So he'd never really been in libraries before. But he thought he wanted to look around this old building. He thought it might be a bit spooky, might be exciting. And as he walked into the library, he noticed that there was instantly a smell of old books. And everyone was very quiet in the library. And his imagination always ran away with him. 
And so he wanted to see some of these really old books. So he walked around, he saw books that were quite new, books that didn't look that old, and then books that didn't have pictures on or typical covers. And he thought these must be the really old books. And he saw an interesting old book, something about it, the way it was made, the detail on it, how ornate the book was. Something about it made him pick it off the shelf, and it was a heavy book, a dusty book. And he guessed that it must be about half his own weight as he picked it off the shelf. And he sat down cross-legged on the floor, resting the book in front of him, opened the cover, and saw old writing, symbols, and what looked almost like hand-drawn pictures and hand-coloured pictures. And he saw the date of the book, and that it was from the 1700s. And he thought about how old that was as a book. And he felt the pages as he turned them over, felt what that paper felt like. And he started to read. And while he started to read, the most unusual thing started to happen. The book began to glow. Initially it was a glow that was almost imperceptible. He just had a feeling that somehow light was coming from the book. And then that glowing intensified and expanded. And the glowing was filling the whole space of the book. And then the glowing continued to expand and reached the young lad. And he felt a tingling sensation as the glowing was touching his legs. And yet he felt incredibly comfort and relaxation from this. And the glowing ball of light got brighter and more intense as it spread to engulf the boy and the book. It was as if he's in his own little bubble, a kind of energy bubble or a light bubble. And he didn't know why this light bubble, why this ball of light was engulfing him and the book. But once it had expanded large enough to engulf him and the book, it stopped expanding. And he thought to himself that this was unusual, because you'd expect that the light would just shine on in different directions, and yet it appeared to just engulf him and the book, and then stop.
and on the inside of this bubble of light, he started to notice swirling, different patterns, different colours, different shapes, different lights and darks, swirling and moving on this bubble all around him, wherever he looked. And he looked down at the book and he continued to read. And while he was reading, the swirling patterns on the light began to take shape, began to take form. As if it was starting to try and form what he was reading on the inside of this ball of light. And he continued reading. And the images continued to form even more on this ball of light. And as he finished the first chapter in the book, and then started chapter two, so he noticed when he looked up from the book that he could see this vast land that he was now unaware that there was a ball of light because projected on the ball of light in all directions was a scene from the book And he stood up, and it was as if, actually, he was here now. And he looked down at his feet to where the book was, and there was no book there. Now he'd stood up. He was in this story land. And he sat down again and noticed that the book was there again and the floor looked a bit more like the library floor. And he stood up again and he couldn't see the library floor. Everything just looked like this story land. And he realised that somehow this bubble seemed to be almost like a virtual reality generator, seemed to be making it real. And that's how he thought of it, as a gamer. And he had the strangest feeling, almost like he was feeling compelled to walk somewhere, and he didn't know where. And so he walked away from this spot where the book was, he turned to look at that spot. He thought, how can he remember where this book is? Because you can't see it. You can't see the bubble. You can't see that light or anything when you walk away from it. So he looked around him. He found himself some sticks. And he stuck them upright in the ground. sticking them upright around roughly where he knew the book was so that he could come back and see those sticks and then sit back down and he'll find the book and he can close the book and he assumed closing the book would probably close this story. But for now he felt like he needed to follow his compulsion he didn't really understand what that meant. He just had this feeling. And so he walked over hills. He could see a vast land out before him. He could see what looked like a medieval city. Off in other directions he could see small little towns what looked like dirt tracks between the cities and towns. 
and they're all reasonably small places. You could see woodland. You could notice a large lake off in the distance, the other side of a city. And mountains way off in the distance. And a cloudy sky. And he could feel the breeze on his face. And he started walking towards the city. He walked down the hill, joined the path and then started following the path towards the city. And as he walked, he wondered where this place was. He felt that it seemed like the place that was set up in the first chapter of the book. So he walked and he headed towards that city. And as he got near the city, he could hear milling about of people. He could see marketplaces. He could hear people with carts, pushing and pulling carts and horse and carts over cobbled streets and dirt tracks and graveled areas and all the different sounds that these made. And so he walked into the city and noticed what the buildings looked like, all handmade, most of them single story, all medieval looking. And he found a notice board in the city, and he felt drawn to one of the notices on the notice board. And that notice talked about having to find a beacon. And it gave some cryptic clues as to how to do that. And the boy didn't know what the cryptic clues meant. But he had this feeling like he was living out the story. And that it didn't matter that he didn't know what it meant. Because he wouldn't know what it meant if he read the story. What would happen is that he would just live out the story and likely work it out. So he put the note into his pocket and noticed he wasn't dressed in his usual clothes. He was dressed to fit the time period, to fit the environment and the story. And he felt this compulsion to walk through the city and out the city gates at the far side in the direction of the lake and the mountains. So he walked through the city, taking in the hustle and bustle, the way people were talking, different sights and sounds. He wondered if maybe he would have his own place somewhere here in the city. And at the city gates, he saw a stables. And a man greeted him and asked if he wanted to use a horse. And he felt himself say yes. And he was given a horse and he climbed on the horse. And compared to his size, the horse seemed huge. And so he started his journey towards the lake on that horse, just trotting along, feeling the bouncing up and down on the horse while trotting, the sound of its hooves on the path. 
and the path started off well, all cobbled and well looked after. But he ended up turning onto a path some way out of the city. It was more of a dirt track, and he followed that path, along towards the lake. And as he reached the lake, he dismounted from his horse, walked along with his horse, put his hand in the lake just to feel the temperature of the water and splosh it about a little. Noticed how the lake was quite still, just gentle ripples from one side to the other and the occasional movement from the wind blowing across the lake. And he walked along the lake towards a bridge, and as he reached the bridge that crossed right over the lake, he could see an elderly man with a cane just sat there, as if he was just waiting for something. And as he approached the bridge, the elderly man started talking to him. And his talking appeared quite cryptic. And yet somehow he felt like he knew what was being said. He just didn't know how or why. And then the elderly man gave him something. Gave him a small little crystal that was circular and perfectly polished. And then the man showed him on his way and guided him with his hand across the bridge. And so the lad crossed that bridge with his horse and was aware of the way the horse's footsteps clipped and clopped on the wooden bridge. And he wondered to himself about whether the bridge was rickety, given it was quite long and it went across this lake. And he stopped in the middle of the bridge just to take in the view up and down the lake before continuing on to the other side. And then on the other side of the bridge, on the other side of the lake, the lad got back onto the horse and continued trotting along the dirt track that went along the other side of the lake. And he continued to follow that track down towards those mountains. And he was aware as he trotted along that the sun was gradually setting, and that he was getting hungry. So he wondered about where he could stop for the night. that it made sense that he would need to stop. But then he also wondered what people will think in the library. Will they be seeing him sat on the floor reading? Will he have disappeared? What will people in the library have seen? And if he's about to find somewhere to settle down for the night, what happens to him in the library? Is he still sat in the library? Do people see him still there? Has he vanished from the library? What about his parents? 
if he settles down to sleep for the night, does that mean that they're going to wonder where he is all night? He didn't feel he could just turn back, he just hoped it would somehow be okay. He felt this compulsion to have to complete his mission. And so as he began to approach those mountains, he decided to turn into the woodland, to turn just off from the lake, turn a little way into the tree line that went along the edge of the lake. and set up a camp just off the ground among the trees. And he created himself a hammock off the ground, noticing that in his backpack that he didn't even know that he had. He had some material to make a hammock, which he tied between some trees. And he had some other material that he tied between trees, over the top of the hammock, almost like making a roof. And just down by the lake, he dug a bit of a hole, put some wood into that hole, and started a fire and sat next to that fire for the evening, as the sun set and the sky turned orange. And he could see the moon rising, the stars appearing, hear the crackling of the fire, feeling the warmth of the fire, hearing the gentle lapping of the lake water on the shore. And he cooked himself some food. And his horse rested and ate as well. And he was curious how this story was going to pan out. He thought about what it feels like to be a character in a story. He knew he was searching for something. And then, just as it got quite late, he covered over the fire to put the fire out. Got a blanket out of his bag climbed up into the hammock and lay down and closed his eyes and he gently felt the way the hammock swayed in the trees the way it just gently swayed left and right almost like it was rocking him gently to sleep and he drifted off into a comfortable, relaxing sleep for the night. And he could feel the breeze on his face, and yet felt so comfortable and calm under that blanket. And then in what seemed like no time at all, he was aware of being awoken by the sun rising, the sounds of birds increasing. He felt so relaxed, so refreshed and revitalized from his night's sleep. He climbed down from the hammock, took everything down, packed it all away, ate some of the food he'd saved from the night before, Noticed his horse was awake. 
and waiting for him. And then began his journey again up towards those mountains. He was unsure how he was going to find a beacon, but he knew he had to find a beacon. He just felt that somehow the story must be unfolding in such a way that he'll just find it. The story must know what story is being told and that he's just a character going along for the ride. And he reached the foot of the mountains and felt he had to leave the horse here. He decided not to tie the horse up, but to allow the horse to roam freely while he's gone, so that the horse could get some food and stretch its legs. And he trusted that the horse would be there when he comes back, because it's a story, and if the horse isn't, then that would just be part of the story. And he started climbing up into the mountains. And initially his climb was really easy. But as he got higher, so it got colder. And as it got colder, so he would notice areas of ice and snow. And that was just increasing the higher into the mountains he went. And after some time climbing and being exhausted, he decided to stop for a break for a moment. And he sat down on a rock, turned around and looked over back in the direction he came. He could see the lake, he could see the bridge, he could see the cities and towns, all the way back to where he came from. And while he looked, he quite enjoyed the view. He felt it was like some of the games he'd played. Where you go on these quests. And so he took some time to have something to eat again. Before continuing his journey up the mountain. He felt this compulsion of where to go but didn't really know where he was going. All he knew was his quest idea. He knew what he had to achieve. And after some time walking, he saw a cave and he wondered whether he should go into the cave. He felt this compulsion to enter the cave. So he assumed that must be where he has to go next. And at the entrance to the cave was a stick with a flame on it. And so he took that off the wall and walked into the cave. And as he walked into the cave, so he noticed the way the air sounded different, the way it rushed through the cave and echoed. How noise sounded different, how a lot of the mountain sounds quickly began to fade and it sounded so much quieter but different noises, how each footstep became echoey in the cave and he could hear drips echoing in the cave. And he found it interesting the way that the flickering flame he was carrying danced and flickered, creating different patterns of shadows and light on the walls of the cave. 
as you walk deeper and deeper into the mountain. And as he walked deeper and deeper into the mountain, so he became curious about what was going to happen, where he was going. And he encountered a door. And he knew it was a door because he'd seen these sort of things in games he'd played, even though it looked like a smooth rock. He just had to figure out how to open it. And then he saw a slight indentation in the wall. And he took what the man on the bridge gave him. He placed it into that indentation. And with a rocky noise sound, the door slid open. And then he walked in through that door and found himself in a vast chamber. And in the middle of the chamber was a pedestal with a book on it. And he walked over and he looked at the book. And in the pages of the book, were cryptic clues and maps and different symbols. And so he looked through the different clues, trying to figure out what it must mean. And he noticed that some of the symbols were also in the room. He saw that in the four corners of the room were tall cylindrical rocks that had symbols on them and writing on them. And at the back of the room was what looked like a door. And above that door were four symbols. And so he worked out that what he must have to do is go to each of those cylinders and turn them round and perhaps make it so that the same symbols that are above the door are perhaps facing the symbols on the floor in front of the cylinders. And each cylinder was really heavy and he pushed and he managed to just about turn each one, one at a time. And once he turned all four so that the cylinder and the symbols all matched up, suddenly the door slid open and he could see daylight again. It was as if he'd walked straight through the mountain. And the sun was high in the sky. And he started walking down the mountain, down this far side of the mountain. He looked back and up and he could see how high the mountain was. And he was glad he didn't have to climb to the top. Glad he didn't have to climb over the mountain, but instead he was able to cut through in this way. And he walked down the mountain. And he noticed that the land on this side seemed totally different type of land to the land where he came from. definitely seemed far more sunny 
than the land he came from. It had a more positive vibe to it. And at the foot of the mountain was a forest. And so he walked all the way down that mountain, walked into the forest. And he began to hack his way through the forest. Not knowing where he was going, just running on instinct. Creating his path, hacking his way through the forest. Where he came to a lake. And he saw a small island in the middle of the lake, but he didn't know how to get there. But he had this feeling like that's where he's supposed to be. And while he was sat by the shore of the lake, wondering how he's supposed to get to the centre, suddenly the most beautiful mermaid appeared from under the water. And she told him how he can get to the lake, that he has to believe And that if he believes enough, the water will part and a path will appear between where he is and the centre of the lake. And he thought that's unlikely to be the case. How would the water just part like that? And she just said, you have to believe. And he said, but I don't believe. The water can't just part. And she just said, you have to believe. And so he thought, okay, I'm going on instinct. Everything else has worked out fine. I found solutions easily and effortlessly. Accepting what comes up in my mind. And so he felt, okay, I believe. And he walked towards the water. And as he walked towards the water, he could see that the edge of the lake started rippling. And moving. And the ripples on the lake were all heading in one direction, as the wind was blowing across the lake, and yet the ripples just in front of where he was walking were almost like there was a force field given off by this boy, because the ripples were heading from one point back outwards across the other ripples, and as he reached the water's edge and went to take a step, in the water, the water parted out the way of his step, and then he took another step, and another step, and with every step he took, the water moved out the way, and the water seemed to close behind him and move in front of him, so that he was walking on dry land. while the water was just working its way around him, creating a path. And within a few steps, he gained confidence that this was going to continue. And so he carried on walking and walking until he reached that island in the centre of the lake. And at the island in the centre of the lake, he found a switch, and he flicked that switch. And suddenly this bright beacon 
lit up the sky, beaming a long shard of light straight upwards from the middle of the island, out of a stone column. And then the beacon began to turn golden from the top down as that light beamed up into the sky. And he could see that light beam reaching really high in the sky and then it was spreading out in all directions, spreading that light out, almost like it was encircling the land. He didn't know quite what this beacon was doing or why. He just knew it appeared to be encircling the land. And he felt this compulsion to now have to get off the island and head back the way he came, across the lake. So he walked back across the lake and the waters parted again for him. And he didn't know what he had done, what the outcome of this was, or what he had to do next. He now just felt that he had to walk in a different direction. So he started walking in a new direction away from the lake. Walking around the edge of the lake, and then following a stream that led away from the lake. And whenever he looked up, he could see that light spreading and encircling the land. And he knew this was a good thing, but he didn't know why or what was happening. And he followed this stream. And then the stream reached a waterfall. And he had to climb down a cliff down the side of the waterfall. And so he carefully climbed down that cliff, aware of the spray of the water, refreshing his face. And he climbed down that cliff to the bottom. And at the bottom he could notice the most beautiful rainbow in the waterfall. And he continued to follow this stream that was getting wider and calmer. And he followed the stream and it got wider and calmer and wider and calmer. Until suddenly he encountered a dragon. And the dragon just was sitting there. And the dragon, in a deep voice, spoke about how some parts of the land had a darkness fall across the land. And that some people had become aggressive towards dragons. And yet dragons were the saviours of the land. Dragons watched over the land. And that what this boy had done was to create light again. To create light to the land. And that this dragon was gradually recharging was basking in that light and recharging to be able to take off and fly. To be able to watch over the land once again. And so the boy spoke with the dragon about this land 
about where this darkness came from and whether this is all that's needed to get rid of the darkness. And the dragon explained that now the light is here. The darkness will fade and the dragons can keep that darkness away can keep the cities and towns safe once again. The people will be more positive, optimistic. People will believe in hope and love. And the dragon encouraged the boy onto his back. And as he fully charged himself and got all his energy back, the dragon stretched out its wings and launched up into the air. And the boy had a sense of excitement as the air rushed through his hair. As the dragon took him across the land, let him survey the land, view what was happening, and view how this light was changing the darkness. The boy noticed the dazzling bright white light piercing all corners of this land as he flew up higher and higher over the tops of the mountain range. And he wondered about the horse, and the dragon said the horse would be okay. The horse will find its own way home. And the dragon swooped down and landed near the city, lowered its neck, lowered its head, and the boy climbed off. And he walked over to some villagers that were waiting for him. And they thanked him for his help. And they gave him a little something to remember them by. And they said, any time you want to come back here, want to visit the land, just hold on to this. And he walked through the village, walked through the city, having a look around one last time, before then coming out the other side, working his way back to where that book should be. And he walked up that grassy hill. He could see his sticks there. And he walked and went around the sticks, knelt down next to the sticks, and could see the book and the library floor. And he crossed his legs, sat in front of those pages, took one last look around him at the land he could see, wondering whether he truly can come back here again in the future, deciding that if this is what reading is like, maybe he'll take up reading more. He then closed the book and in an instant everything vanished and he found himself just sat on the floor in the library 
He looked up at the clock, and he saw that it didn't appear like any time had gone by. And yet he knew he'd been gone for at least 24 hours. He'd been gone, he'd slept in that land overnight. He'd eaten. He'd flown on the back of a dragon. All of that had happened, and yet almost no time at all seems to have passed. And he looked around him, and there were still people sat at tables, still people walking along the shelves, having a look at the books. As if he had just been sat on the floor reading, and no one else had seen this bright light. No one else had seen the experience he just had. He wondered whether he can get this book out of the library, but saw that it's a book that can only be read in the library. So he put it back on the shelf before leaving the library, wandering out into the daylight, feeling that somehow this daylight is brighter than he remembered it. and continued this alternative journey home. And it took him a bit longer, this route, but he felt that he would take this route again in the future. And so he continued his journey home. And when he arrived home, he tried telling his parents about his experience. And they just humoured him and said, yes, that sounds like it's fascinating, you read a book, and... And they didn't really believe the experience he had. They just thought he had a vivid imagination. And he was sure it wasn't his imagination. He then went up to his room and sat on his bed. And just before he decided to go to sleep, he put his hand in his pocket and found that thing that he was given. By the villagers. And he realised that it wasn't a dream. That it wasn't a vivid imagination. It was real. What he experienced really happened to him. And so he put that down on the cabinet next to his bed. Climbed into bed. Snuggled up. Closed his eyes. And with a good feeling and a smile on his face. He drifted comfortably and relaxed. Asleep. 